years ago, an independent professional investment organization was set up to invest the Canada Pension Plan on behalf of the millions of working and retired Canadians. It had a very clear goal, which is to earn the best possible investment returns. And today, CPP Investments invests across public equities, private equities, bonds, private debts, real estate, infrastructure, and many other areas, all in order to build a resilient, globally diversified portfolio and to grow the CPP fund to help ensure the financial security of millions of Canadians now and for generations to come. Hello, a warm welcome to everyone in New Brunswick joining us today. Thank you for making the time to be with us at our public meeting. My name is Heather Monroe Bloom and I have the pleasure of serving as chair of CPP Investments, the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board. Every two years we hold public meetings with Canadians. It's our commitment to update you on how we are investing the CPP fund to help ensure it will be there for many years to come and to provide you with an opportunity to ask questions directly to our leadership. CPP is an important foundation for Canadians in retirement. Understanding the fund's performance and sustainability will provide information and reassurance regarding how it fits into planning for your future. This year, against the backdrop of the global pandemic, we're holding these meetings virtually. We believe this is the safest way to provide you with a full report on our work, while at the same time giving you an opportunity to ask questions. In developing today's program, we talked with numerous Canadians in advance. We wanted to determine what questions you might like us to address. Over the next 20 minutes, we will touch on many of these topics, including our approach to sustainable investing and how we design a resilient CPP fund for the long term. We will also share our most recent financial performance and you will hear from our CEO, his perspective on the current global economic situation. Finally, we have 35 minutes set aside to answer your questions. You may submit your questions at any time during the presentation and we will do our utmost to respond during the question period and if not, we'll follow up with you after the broadcast. Ten years ago, I joined the board of CPP Investments and I was honored to become chairperson in 2014. Over these years, our steadfast goal has been to provide the highest standard of governance and oversight at CPP Investments. Let me begin by saying a few words about how we do this on your behalf. In a challenging and rapidly changing environment, sound governance plays a critical role in ensuring that CPP Investments continues to meet its obligations to each of you, the 20 million Canadians who contribute to the CPP Fund and those that rely on it as part of their financial security in retirement. CPP Investments operates at arm's length from federal and provincial governments and is guided by the independent, highly qualified professional board of directors, which I am privileged to chair. Our governance structure is designed to support a clear goal to invest the funds that come in from contributors, maximizing returns without incurring excessive risk. In addition, the assets in the CPP fund are strictly segregated from all government funds and are thus protected from any political interference. Our board is comprised of experienced individuals with the skill sets and expertise needed to provide effective oversight of this global investment organization. The board is also diverse with a wide range of relevant professional backgrounds and global experience. We are each committed to serving the key public purpose of the fund. We are strong believers in the value of transparency and open dialogue and mindful of the important role entrusted to us to help ensure the CPP remains sustainable for future generations. That's why each year we publish an annual report of our financial performance and in it other important information which you can find on our corporate website. And every two years we hold public meetings across Canada to answer questions from Canadians. Over the past 24 months, the board has continued its ongoing commitment to continually enhancing our governance. This has included approving the next phase of the organization's long-term strategic direction, a renewed focus on conduct and culture, 
and further strengthening of our risk management practices. Last year, the board approved a new integrated risk framework for the organization, and this year, the board created a standing risk committee that oversees this area. Our approach looks at all risks holistically, from those that stem from investment decisions to those posed by financial markets. We also keep an ongoing watch over emerging threats, such as climate change, cybersecurity, and geopolitical risks. Our ongoing crisis preparedness has positioned us to respond quickly to the COVID-19 pandemic. Through 2020, the board has worked closely with management to ensure the fund is well positioned to manage through the significant financial and operational impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Acknowledging these unprecedented circumstances, my fellow directors and I are confident that management is taking every appropriate step to weather these exceptional challenges to best of ability. We continue to have strong conviction in the organization's planning for the long term. Our highly constructive and collaborative relationship with management enables us to work together on the evolution of our strategy. Management understands their role in executing the strategy and the board's role remains focused on oversight and guidance. Our 2025 business strategy, approved two years ago, is designed to keep us well positioned to mitigate future financial disruptions and to capitalize on new growth opportunities in the years ahead. We strive to remain a leader in realizing global governance best practices for our industry and we actively promote strong governance practices not only in CPP investments but in all of the companies in which we invest. In doing so, we continue to represent the very best interests of you, our contributors and beneficiaries across Canada. On behalf of the Board of Directors and Management, we're united in our commitment to the highest standards of corporate governance and we're proud to be recognized internationally as a leader in pension plan management. I'm very pleased to report that your CPP fund is in strong, capable hands under the leadership of our CEO, Mark Machen. I would now like to turn it over to Mark to share a few words with you. Thank you, Heather. We're living in extraordinary times. The global pandemic continues to impact people, communities, and economies. It's altered our lives and how we live. And while this is not the first disease to spread around the world, this pandemic is casting a long shadow. Health officials and governments are learning many things about COVID-19 with better treatments, testing, and the global race to develop and produce a viable vaccine well underway. Yet, there's much more we need to know. It's this uncertainty and the start-stop of reopenings that's adversely impacting confidence in global economies. And Canada is not immune. Our economists at CPP Investments project the world economy will contract by 3.4% this year, a stark reversal from the 2.8% growth anticipated at the beginning of the year. Yet we're now starting to see improvements in many parts of the world where the economies are emerging from lockdowns and are now turning back to growth. In Canada, as businesses and retail have started to reopen, recovery has begun. However, it will likely be slow and extend well into 2021. All of you across Canada, from coast to coast to coast, have been deeply impacted. But there's one thing you don't need to worry about, and that's the financial security of the CPP fund. We invest the CPP fund to weather all types of storms. And while a global pandemic of this magnitude is rare, the likelihood of a big event affecting financial markets is more frequent. We not only anticipate, we prepare for moments like this. Over the past decade, we've enhanced our risk management practices and, and properly prepared a financial crisis plan, business continuity practices, and even a pandemic response plan. So when the pandemic hit, we quickly moved from nine offices globally to more than 1,800 home offices, continuing to invest the CPP fund with the same skill, professionalism, and good judgment to help protect your retirement security. The strength of our long-term investing approach is a well-diversified portfolio that helps to ensure the fund is resilient. We invest across the globe in a wide range of industries and asset classes to ensure the investments are diversified and not dependent on just one area. 
And this minimizes the risk to the fund and helps us to earn the best possible returns over the long term. Right now, the global pandemic is actually accelerating growth in healthcare, technology, data infrastructure, and renewable energy. And that's where we're making investments amongst many other diverse sectors. We're also looking closely at emerging opportunities created by the new habits likely to shape our post-COVID world. Opportunities such as the rise of e-commerce and online grocery, the adoption of telehealth, the increase in remote work, the creation of new complex supply chains, and the shift in population away from urban centers. We expect some of these to be long-lasting and will create significant investment opportunities for the future. Over the next 12 to 18 months, we expect the global economy will bounce back, albeit slowly. But whatever happens, you can continue to trust the CPP will be there for you for many years to come. Here's a short report on our performance. At CPP Investments, we never lose sight of our long-term objectives in our daily work. Maximize investment returns for the CPP fund and minimize risk to help provide financial security for generations of Canadians. The fund grew to $434.4 billion as of June 30th, 2020, a $33.8 billion increase over the past 12 months. Our active management strategy and the strength of the diversified investment portfolio we've built over the years allowed us to weather the storm as the world faced extreme challenges this year. We can't always predict the future, yet we do plan for it. Our sophisticated investors take a disciplined long-term approach to diversify the fund across geographies and asset classes, maximizing our returns over a long horizon against a wide range of possible events. That's why the true test of our performance is our long-term results. In the last 10 years, we earned 10.7% net nominal return, or $259.8 billion in net income after all costs. Investing today with an eye to the future, we're building a portfolio designed to grow and generate returns over time. This year, we continue to make significant investments in innovative healthcare and advanced technologies, infrastructure, autonomous vehicles, and renewable energy, all critical in the years to come. Now, as we look ahead to a period of uncertainty, we will stay on course with our long-term investing strategy, prudently manage our capital, and closely manage our existing portfolio of investments, We'll continue to stress test our portfolio as we always do, looking at optimal diversification and strong investment returns under a variety of future scenarios. This way, we can be confident that the fund will continue to deliver decades of steady performance. It's why the latest report from the Chief Actuary of Canada confirmed that the fund remains sustainable for at least 75 years. While our daily lives may have changed, the sustainability of the CPP fund has not. Our sound long-term strategy is essential now more than ever. We'll continue to invest and grow the fund for millions and millions of Canadians as a critical part of their financial security today and for many years ahead. Investments, we believe sustainable investing is simply smart long-term investing. We have a clear goal to maximize return without undue risk of loss. Effectively managing environmental, social, and governance factors creates sustainable value over the long term. Ten years ago, we set up a group to look at environmental, social, and governance risks. And that group has grown from two people to 15 people today that look at investments across the organization to assess these risks. We recently updated our policy on sustainable investments to more clearly articulate the business case for doing this and our expectations of corporates with respect to how they integrate ESG considerations into their strategy and operations. When it comes to actively engaging with companies, we focus on five key areas. Water, one of the world's most critical resources. Human rights, because companies that don't respect human rights face potential operational turmoil, higher legal risks, lack of community support, and damage to their reputation. Executive compensation, we see clear evidence of long-term shareholder value when there is alignment between executive pay and company performance. Board effectiveness, Having a diverse board in place to guide strategy and oversee risks is critical to achieving superior financial performance. 
We have a global board gender voting practice to take a stand for increased representation of women on corporate boards around the world. In 2020, CPP Investments voted against the election of directors at 323 international companies for not having any women on their boards. And finally, climate change, one of the most significant global challenges of our time. Climate change is one of the big issues of our generation. And as long-term investors, we need to think about both the risks and opportunities that climate change present. Climate change creates investment opportunities as well. For example, in renewable energy, where we've made investments in wind energy, in solar energy, and another one would be electric vehicle charging stations. We think that's gonna be a, a, an important piece of infrastructure in the future where there are more and more electric vehicles on the road. Over the last year, all major transactions have incorporated climate change due diligence. We've reviewed over 100 transactions worth more than $100 billion. We aim to deliver the investment teams and their investment committees clear line of sight of both the climate risks and opportunities associated with the investment, but also approaches to managing those risks or capturing those opportunities where we proceed with the investment. One thing that we're really excited about is something that's happening here in Canada, which is an investment that we've made into carbon capture technology that we think could be really important in the future. Meeting the needs of almost 8 billion people on the planet today is already creating tipping points with respect to water stress, pollution, income inequality and many more factors. Consumers' expectations are quickly changing in response to this and the number of companies that have failed to realize this and destroyed considerable shareholder value continues to grow. To be a successful investor in this new century, we have to be able to identify the companies proactively managing this reality, but also those failing to capture the risks and opportunities of this new century. In some ways, the pandemic has pulled forward the future in terms of change. So now we have an opportunity to invest in things like climate change, where we can put our money to work in things that will help us have a more prosperous, sustainable, and healthy environment. think that many of us have really thought long term about how we're going to save up for retirement. And when we do think about it, it's usually that retirement is a long way out. Young people are concerned about buying their first home and settling into their careers. Retirement isn't on their radar. Many people don't have access to company pension plans that may have been available for previous generations. And on top of that, many people are struggling to save for retirement. Having the enhancements to the CPP is critically important to their financial security in retirement. The increased benefits are really important for Canadians in the long term. It's going to provide a stronger and more stable income for today's generation and for future beneficiaries. Canadians to know that the CPP will be there for them when they retire. It's a foundation for their retirement that they can count on. A lot of our investments globally are very long term. We really make the best investments through our intensive research deep dives into specific industries or sectors. I think it's great that we have a separate organization that actually manages the money on behalf of Canadians that's sustainable for the long term and it will be there for people when they retire. Whether you're starting in your career or you're nearing retirement, it's important to the social fabric of our country. I get to see firsthand the bright, talented minds that work at CPP Investments. It's inspiring to see how many people are dedicating their lives to growing the fund and working towards a very important public purpose. At CPP Investments, we design a portfolio to help ensure the CPP is strong, resilient, and sustainable for the long term. Our team of professional investors invests around the world in public and private assets like stocks, bonds, real estate, and infrastructure. 
Together, this delivers a well-balanced, globally diversified portfolio that will help achieve higher returns over a very long horizon and materially above what could be achieved through a low-cost passive investment strategy. In designing a portfolio, the first step is looking at the risk. What is the appropriate risk target? Because we have to take some amount of risk in order to earn returns. We consider market losses or short-term volatility, reputational risk, and the ability to sustain a long-term strategy. We have to balance short-term risk with longer-term returns. If we took an insufficient amount of risk, we would not be able to sustain the plan in the longer term. But on the other hand, if we took too much risk, there'd be more volatility in the near term and downside risk for beneficiaries and recipients. So we try to balance those two things together to get the best outcomes for contributors and beneficiaries in the near term and in the long term. The total portfolio approach means that we look beyond the asset class labels and try to identify what are the risk return factors that drive returns for different investments. Principally, these are economic drivers, things like GDP growth, the business cycle, interest rates, inflation, the way in which those broad economic factors affect asset returns. And we try to design a portfolio that's quite balanced across all those various economic factors. The reason for that is that they often behave in quite different ways. So by having a balanced set of exposures, we get a more resilient portfolio that's better diversified and more able to deliver on our mandate. Diversification is the most powerful way to mitigate market downturns and enhance investment returns. It helps to build a resilient portfolio. And the way diversification works is effectively it means that you are investing in assets and sectors and companies that don't move together all at the same time. One asset may be doing well and another asset is not doing so well and there's kind of a natural offset or, or a bit of insurance or hedge that comes from diversification. You could think of it as essentially meaning that we're not putting all our eggs in one basket. We're putting our eggs in a lot of different baskets. If a given country is doing poorly and you can't be sure in advance whether that will happen, you've also invested in another country that's doing well. The same thing would be true with particular companies. And this enables us to have a more resilient portfolio. To determine how resilient our portfolio is, we perform stress tests to see how it will react under various scenarios. And then, COVID hit. Market crisis due to COVID-19 in March was unprecedented. However, in a crisis like that, you just really discover whether the diversification is working. And the diversification in our portfolio worked as intended. So our losses in the portfolio were limited because they are offset by the outperformance or the gains from government bonds and the depreciation of the Canadian dollar. And it worked exactly as we expected. We manage the fund in a way that's responsible, disciplined, and consistent with our mandate so that there's sustained value added over the long term. CPP Investments also has in place robust valuation processes to measure the fair values of our investments on an ongoing basis. With a well-balanced and globally diversified portfolio, Canadians can trust that the CPP will be there for you today and for generations to come. On behalf of the more than 1,800 CPP investment professionals around the world and our board of directors, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. We hope we've given you a better understanding of what we do and of our commitment to you, the more than 20 million CPP contributors and beneficiaries. We would now like to move to the question and answer session of our meeting. Hello and welcome to all CPP contributors and beneficiaries in New Brunswick. As Heather just mentioned, we're now moving to this final segment of the public meeting, the question and answer period. Before kicking it off, I would like to note that we are currently meeting virtually throughout all of New Brunswick and would therefore like to acknowledge the lands and traditional territories of the indigenous peoples of New Brunswick. My name is Tara Perkins and I'm CPPIB's Managing Director of External Affairs. We're happy to host these meetings to provide you, the CPP contributors and beneficiaries, the opportunity to ask questions about our organization and the role that it plays in helping ensure the fund's sustainability.
I'll be moderating the session today and I'm here with John Graham, who is our Senior Managing Director and Global Head of Credit Investments, who will be answering your questions. Great, thanks Tara. And before we begin, um, on behalf of the entire organization, uh, let me extend our appreciation and gratitude to everyone for joining us here today. As Tara mentioned, my name is John Graham. I'm a Senior Managing Director and Global Head of Credit Investments at CPP Investments. The Credit Investment Department, we're one of six investment departments at CPP Investments, and we invest in credit assets around the globe. Basically, we buy bonds and loans. I'm also a member of the Senior Management Team. The senior Management Team is responsible for the overall strategy and the overall operations of the fund. I'm thrilled to be here today to answer your questions and hopefully provide some key insights into CPP investments. And we definitely do encourage those questions. So if you haven't seen it, if you look to the bottom left-hand side of your screen, you'll see the blue ask button where you can submit those. Thank you to those of you who submitted some in advance. We've received quite a few. We want to ensure that there's time for live questions as well. If we're unable to respond to all of the questions in this um, segment today, then we will keep them on file. And in keeping with our protocols, we'll aim to get back to you by email in a timely manner. So John, should we kick it off? The first question is regarding the implications of climate change for the fund, I would appreciate if you could explain in day-to-day -day terms how climate change affects the fund and over what time period. What are the real impacts of climate change at this point in time? Great, uh, thank you and, and thank you very much for the question. This is a question we've re been receiving through these provincial meetings and, and frankly in between the meetings. Um, I'll start out by saying that climate change is real climate change is material, and the implications for the fund are very, very significant. I'd encourage everyone to visit our corporate website. Uh, we recently published our 2020 report on sustainable investing, and this will provide more detail and more information on how we think about climate change and incorporate it into our investment process. Now, with respect to climate change, um, we would incorporate that into our environmental, social, and governance framework. And that's really embedded in, in how we invest and how we manage the portfolio. You know, climate change is a key risk and one that really is taken into consideration for all our investments. So maybe starting with new investments that we make. Um, all material new investments really must incorporate climate change risk. Um, that includes scenario analysis, includes sensitivity analysis. And I just share that as a senior team, as we're looking at new investment opportunities, the impact of climate change is discussed in, in every committee meeting and really debated and, and we really need to understand the implications. We also have a very large existing portfolio. Um, we have assets in real estate, we have assets in infrastructure, we have toll roads, and we've been implementing a very systematic process for evaluating climate change risk on our existing portfolio. New data comes in all the time, new information comes in, and we need to make sure that we're incorporating that in how we manage the assets. So climate change risk is real and, and it is significant and one that we incorporate into our investment process, but climate change also provides opportunities. And a few years ago, the management team decided to build a dedicated power and renewables team really with the focus on uh, building a portfolio, portfolio of renewable energy. Renewable energy has always been on mandate for CPP investments, um, but we decided to build out a team of experts, to build out a team that would spend all day looking for renewable opportunities around the globe. That portfolio has grown from under 100 million two years ago to just over 6 billion today. I think it's one of the areas we expect to grow and one of the areas we expect to see really interesting opportunities. Great, and I would just mention for the viewers, John, the sustainable investing report that uh, you referenced, I think they can actually find that if they look to the left of their screen on the references tab, there should be a link to it uh, right there. And so our next question, uh, can CPPIB talk about how it is factoring in and assessing the increasing geopolitical risks the world is facing into its investment decisions, for example, US-China? Great, thank you. Again, a, a really topical question. Um, it seems that every week there's new articles highlighting US-China tensions, Canada-China tensions. And as an investor, as a global investor, um, there's nothing we'd like more than stable international relations, stable trade, predictable growth. 
but it's not the world we live in. Um, and the first thing we need to do as an organization and as a senior team is be educated and understand and informed of all the geopolitical risks that we're exposed to around the globe. There's two areas I'd like to highlight, maybe two tools in our toolkit for navigating geopolitical risk. The first, that we're a long-term investor, and the second is diversification, which Stephen James referred to in the opening videos. With respect to being a long-term global investor, at CPP Investments, we really think of ourselves as a generational investor. We're here to invest for generations of Canadians. It's not about the next week. It's not about the next quarter. It's about the next decades and driving the best investment returns. We've taken that philosophy and we've embedded it in how we've built the organization and how we've built our portfolio. And just an example, uh, I started at CPP Investments in 2008 when we had one office in Toronto. Um, that year we built our Hong Kong office and then shortly thereafter, the London office. As we sit here today, we have nine global offices, San Francisco, New York, Sao Paulo, Toronto, London, Luxembourg, Mumbai, Hong Kong, and Sydney. Gives us a global footprint. And more importantly, these offices are staffed with highly trained, highly skilled local professionals, local investors who understand the local market, have local relationships, and this local presence really helps us navigate the geopolitical risk. The other area is diversification. As Stephen James mentioned at the beginning in the video, don't put all your eggs in one basket. We're diversified across sector, we're diversified across industry, and we're diversified across geographies. And this diversification across geographies really does help us manage short-term volatility from things like geopolitical risk. So there's a question that we received in advance by video. It was addressed to our CEO, Mark Machen. Why don't we look at that one now? Hi, I'm Krista Ross, CEO of the Fredericton Chamber of Commerce. COVID-19 has had far-reaching effects on our economy that we expect to feel for years to come. Businesses have had a rash of increased costs over the past few years, including a recent hike to CPP rates, as well as evolving new costs due to the pandemic. How has COVID-19 affected the fund's position? What protections are in place for such an economic shock to the system? It's a great question. So we can go now to the response from our CEO, Mark Machen. Thank you for that question. We know that when many Canadians saw that severe volatility in markets earlier this year, they wondered about the impacts on the CPP fund. And we were delighted to be able to report that the funds navigated the downturn really well. We were well prepared for events like these. In fact, over the last decade, we've enhanced our risk management practices. We've implemented what we call an integrated risk approach. We've prepared financial crisis plans and even pandemic response plans. And these were all activated in that first quarter of the calendar year and that along with our really well diversified portfolio meant we were able to weather the impacts of that market volatility well. In fact in our most recent quarter that we reported as of June the 30th the fund has grown to 434 billion dollars and in that first fiscal quarter for us it returned 5.6 percent net of all costs. But what we think is most important is to focus on the long-term returns. And as of June the 30th, we had achieved a 10-year net nominal rate of return of 10.7%. Okay. So our next question that's coming in, John, what percentage of assets under CPP's management are currently allocated towards high carbon holdings, include, including coal, oil, gas, refining, and fossil fuel transportation companies and projects? Please disclose these holdings. Great, thank you. Um, and thank you for the opportun opportunity to address this question. Um, again, I'd, I'd point people to our corporate website and the disclosures on our corporate website. We, uh, in addition to our annual report, our quarterly report, uh, other material disclosure, disclosures, we also do uh, disclose our holdings and you can find them on our corporate website. So as of March 30th, uh, 31st, 2020, 
we had 11.6 billion or 2.8% of the fund in fossil fuels. And that would be across upstream, midstream, downstream, oil service providers, pipelines. And this is invested in Canada, international, um, public and private, uh, and debt and um, equity. Now, with respect to investing in the energy transition, we do invest through the entire energy transition, and we recognize the role that different sectors play within the energy transition, um, and recognize that it's not going to be a light switch, that we won't move off of fossil fuels uh, immediately, and it may take time to move off. Um, it's one of the reasons why we also built out the power and renewables team, why a couple years ago we built out a dedicated renewables team that, as I mentioned, um, Two, three years ago, our holdings were sub 100 million. And today they sit at uh, $6.6 .6 billion invested in renewables. Mm -hmm. So we have a gentleman who's asking, how is CPP managing the reduction of contributors to the fund due to closing businesses and the reduction of Canadians in the workforce due to COVID-19? I know Mark talked on the implications, talked about the implications of COVID-19 a bit, but maybe you could touch on that. Sure. Um, again, thank you for the question. And I think probably the important message here is that the fund is sound. And um, every three years, the Office of the Chief Actuary will evaluate the sustainability of the uh, CPP. And the most recent report was published in December of 2019. And CPP was viewed to be sustainable for another 75 years. Now what's important here with this uh, analysis is it does take into consideration lots of different outcomes with respect to birth rates, with respect to employment, um, and under all of these scenarios, the fund is sound. Okay. So our next question is, what has management done to ensure that CPP investments is diverse and inclusive, and what has it done recently to support the Black Lives Matter movement? Great, thank you, and, and, and thank you for this question. And maybe I'll just start with why diversity and inclusion is important to us uh, as an organization. And it is something that we have really embraced. We're a knowledge-based company. We make investment decisions. And it's really important that we attract and we retain the best talent possible. And the way we attract the best talent is to attract the most diverse talent. Ensure that we'll, we're pulling from the most diverse pool we can when we're hiring. And when people come to CPP investments, it's really important that we have an inclusive culture. We have a culture where people can be themselves at work, regardless of gender, regardless of race, religion, or sexual orientation. We make decisions at CPP investments. And having that diversity of experience, that diversity of thought, that contrarian view, the dissenting view, this just makes us a better investment organization. It just helps us make better decisions. But we've tried to also embed inclusion diversity in how we govern the fund, how we manage the fund, and how we invest. And maybe starting with how we govern. Our board of directors um, is majority female, um, which is, is a great accomplishment. And moving to our senior management team, it also has about 36% uh, females on the senior management team. As an organization, we have 50-50 hiring from a gender diversity perspective. And um, the workforce is, is almost split from a gender perspective. So I think we've made a lot of progress with respect to having a very diverse and inclusive workforce. Talking a little bit about how we invest and how we embed inclusion and diversity in our investment activities. And the best example is how we vote proxies. Vote proxies in Canada and how we vote them globally. Um, we began a few years ago with other institutional investors to vote against chairs of the nominating committee if there was not appropriate gender balance on the board. And that proved to be pretty effective in improving gender balance on Canadian boards. We've now taken that approach globally and last year voted against over 300 times when there was not appropriate gender diversity on the board. Now specifically with the Black Lives Matter, and this is an area that I've personally been involved in, um, Mark Machen, our CEO, recently signed the Black North Pledge and this is a, a commitment to bring in 5% of our students from the black community and to promote 
and achieve 3.5% uh, black representation on board of directors and senior management across Canada. So our next question, John, you've touched on this quite a bit, but um, maybe you can speak to it again. Can you please compare your investments in renewable energy with those in fossil fuels? Great, thanks. Um, obviously, important question, and as I mentioned, one we've received uh, numerous times. So maybe just going back that um, you know, we do invest in the entire energy transition, um, including more traditional sources of energy. Um, as of March 31st, 2020, that was around 2.8% of the fund, um, around $11.6 billion. To put that into context also, and to calibrate, uh, on a dollar basis, it's been flat over the past four years. So that, that program really hasn't grown over the past four years. Um, the renewables, which is a new program for us, and one where we have been building out a dedicated team, has grown from sub-100 million a few years ago to an excess of six billion of AUM today. So we have a question, and John, maybe I can field this one, because it's will there be a recording of the meeting available online? And the answer is yes, it will be available on YouTube uh, within a week or so. We should have it posted up there. Uh, so our next question, John, why doesn't CPPIB invest more in Canada to help the economy and create jobs? Aren't there lots of attractive infrastructure projects available at the moment here? Great, thank you, and thank you for the question. Um, and I'd like to make a couple points um, with this question. One, we do have around 15% of the fund invested in Canada. And um, you think about Canada's role on the global economy, Canada's about 3% of the global economy. So we are overweight Canada um, at 15%. And we will continue to be a bigger investor uh, in Canada. But our mandate is really we have a single fiduciary mandate. We are here to maximize return without undue risk of loss. We do not have a mandate of regional economic development. And to fulfill this mandate, we've taken the approach to be a global investor. As I mentioned, we've built out this global footprint. We've built out the capabilities to invest in private equity, infrastructure, real estate, credit, all over the globe. And this has served Canadians very well in that the past 10 years, as of June 30th, our 10-year returns are 10.7%, which is an excellent 10-year return. And all of that return does accrue back to Canadian beneficiaries. Okay. So this woman is asking, what were your returns by sector this year? Just saying we grew is not good enough because we all kept contributing, so of course you grew. So maybe I would point out in each of our quarterly uh, results, every time we disclose our quarterly results or our annual results, we separate out the investment that's coming from contributions versus the investment or the income that's coming from investment income. Um, but John, maybe you could touch on that. Sure. Um, and, and maybe I'll just share some of our investment performance. And as Tara mentioned, this is all net of contributions, so it's true investment return, it's, and it's also net of all cost um, for, for running the organization. So as of June 30th, we had a 10-year, which I think is, is the important number as a long-term investor of 10.7%. Um, we have a March 31st year-end. Our m most recent fiscal year-end, we had a 3.1% um, return for that year end, which considering that that was really at the depth of COVID in the financial turmoil, also a very strong result. Um, Q1 of this year, which would be from the end of March to the end of June, we had a quarterly return of 5.6%. And again, this is um, after all contributions and after all cost. Okay. So our next question, this woman is saying, I'm concerned about CPP's exposure to investments that hasten greenhouse gas emissions and contribute to other environmental damage. One investment is, ex is in one example, excuse me, are investments in coal extraction in China. Coal is, without question, the highest GHG emission fossil fuel and contributes to significant human health and environmental damages. Canada is even impacted from China's coal emissions through mer mercury depositation that travels across the Pacific Ocean. Why is CPP investing in the coal industry, which is unambiguously contributing to these damaging impacts? 
Great. Well, thank you for the question, and thank you for the opportunity to address this question. Um, with respect to, to Chinese coal, and um, one of the things I did mention earlier is we provide all of our holdings on our, on our website. And I would encourage people to go to our corporate website and they can see our, our, our holdings. And it's something that we, we pride ourselves in the in transparency and our level of disclosure. Um, our Chinese coal holdings are largely through our Chinese public equity holdings. And as an institution, we do uh, invest in thousands of companies um, across the globe. Many of these are in our passive portfolio. Many of these are in our quantitative portfolio. We don't have Chinese coal holdings in our, any of our private active um, holdings. And one of the things we are doing right now is we are going through all of these smaller holdings uh, and we're filtering them through an ESG lens. And that process is, is ongoing right now. And so I'd encourage people next time we publish our holdings to, to visit the website and to look at the updated holdings. But as I mentioned earlier, we do invest in the, in the energy transition with a view that it won't be a, a flick of a switch. And we do engage with companies all through the transition. We recognize coal uh, as a source of fuel is, is, is you know, at a different stage than, than some of the other um, sources. And this is, again, what in engaging with companies across the entire energy transition, um, the emphasis we've placed on the renewables and building out the renewables portfolio and building out our renewables team. Okay. So we've talked a bit in this meeting today, John, about sustainability and this person is asking what the returns are, are needed for the fund to be sustainable for 75 years. Great, great, um, great question. And so I'll answer it that we, we don't explicitly target the return for achieving the, the, the minimum return. Um, we try to get a return much higher than that. As I mentioned, uh, as of June 30th, our 10-year return was 10.7%. The minimum return required to ensure sustainability of CPP is 3.9% real. Um, so the 10.7 is, is considerably higher. And we will continue to try and achieve, again, maximum return without undue risk of loss going forward. Great. So we have a question about the role that governments play in directing the investments in the fund. Could you speak to that? Great. Thank you. And again, a great question. And one of the things that's just important to emphasize is that you know, we have a single fiduciary mandate to maximize return without undue risk of loss. We have no mandate of regional economic development, and we have no political interference in our investment activities. Um, we really do operate as an independent company. We have an independent board of directors that is appointed by federal finance ministers and their provincial counterparts, but it is a professional money management organization that does not have political interference in its investment activities. And also just take the opportunity to share that the funds are segregated from government, um, so there's no risk of government coming in and taking the funds. Great. And I think looking at the clock, John, this is probably going to be our final question. And this is from an individual who has heard that Alberta is considering withdrawing. And they say, if Alberta withdraws from the CPP, what is the impact? Great. And, and again, obviously very topical and, and something that is live today. And I just start by saying that certainly Alberta has every right to ask the questions they are asking. It's within, within their constitutional jurisdiction. Um, to ask these, these questions. And we are confident that Alberta will run a rigorous process to understand the pros and the cons of um, creating an Alberta pension plan. What we do know right now is it's complex. Um, the process will be complex. And the implications, um, at this point, we don't know. Um, because it is complex and, and the implications will be dependent on if there was a withdrawal, what that um, would look at, look like. So with respect for CPP investments, um, what we're focused on right now is really delivering the best investment returns to all Canadians, including Albertans. We do view ourselves as an Alberta-based, Alberta organization. Um, we invest on behalf of Albertans. We invest on behalf of everybody across the country who participates in, in, in CPP. And that's really our focus right now. 
Great. And maybe we'll squeeze in one final question. I think this comes from someone who, uh, who already asked on this topic, which you've touched on, John, but maybe just a final note on this. He says, thank you very much for reporting on the investments in fossil fuels versus renewables. He notes that we still have uh, more in fossil fuels than renewables and is curious how you see that balance evolving over time. Great, um, great follow-up question and, and how we think about evolving over time. And we do invest, as I said, in the entire energy transition and we look at the transition. We look at the role that the different sources of power and energy are playing in the transition. So without being very specific in how we think one area will grow and the percentage, you know, I think it's just the renewable space is growing the investment opportunities are growing. The pace that our renewable portfolio has grown over the past few years from sub 100 million to over six today, I think that's indicative of where we do see the growth going forward and, and where we see the opportunities going forward. Great, and I think we're out of time for these questions <laughs> today. Thank you for doing this. Great, well thank you and, and thank you everyone for your questions. Um, we appreciate your participation today. We certainly appreciate the engagement and we hope it helped. We hope that you're more familiar with CPP investments, and we hope that you got a better sense of the sustainability of the fund for the long term. Now, we will ask you and invite you to complete the short survey that will appear on your screen at the end of the broadcast. So on behalf of our board, on behalf of management, and all of the employees at CPP Investments, thank you again for your participation, and please stay safe. <laughs>